everybody. I'm Michael Ogden, Executive Editor with Credit Union Times. Thanks for joining us online and on social media. Today, I have a very special guest. That man right there is Ronaldo Hardy. Ronaldo is a speaker and consultant in the credit union industry. Very well known, very well liked, very well loved. And today, we're tackling a topic uh, that Ronaldo brought to my attention uh, at this year's GAC. And I was very appreciative that he did. It's about workplace diversity. Ronaldo, how are you, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing very good on this uh, March morning. Yeah, that's right. Louisiana, so. <laughs> You're in Louisiana. I'm in Wisconsin. Totally different weather going on. <laughs> so let's tackle this topic. And and for some, this might be an awkward conversation to have. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I think it's a very important conversation to tackle uh, yes. within this industry. So let, let's kind of get to it. What? What about workplace diversity? What about that topic got you personally interested, Ronaldo? Uh, Well, you know, it's something that I'm super passionate about. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we consider workplace diversity. uh, For me, it's about making sure that we create environments uh, in our organizations where everybody feels included in the experience. You know, um, being a part of a minority category, you know, I actually do understand uh, the effects of a lack of diversity in our organizations. And so, you know, in, in the credit union industry in particular, you know, when you do a scan at the different conferences that we have and you really do look at what's happening in our um, boardrooms, our executive teams, uh, we have an issue, you know, in this area. And so um, I, I decided I wanted to use my voice for good, you know, and I've been doing some work. Uh, in this area, both with educational background, but also in um, making sure that I put some of these ideas into practice in the organizations I've been a part of, and I've been able to see the value of of diversity and and even more so inclusion, you know, making sure that we are inclusive culture. Very Uh, good. I'm passionate about seeing that happen across the board. Excellent. And and seriously, I, I'm not joking. When you are one of the nicest people I've ever met inside the uh, credit union industry. And, and, you know, I've always appreciated our connection over the years. And so let's kind of get to this. You and I uh, kind of had a pre-discussion about this. And it broke yeah. it down into like four areas. The first one uh, we kind of came up with is really frustrations that that sometimes people are scared inside credit unions to even yeah. bring up this fact of a lack of workplace diversity. Why are they scared to do that? Well, you know, I think that it has a lot to do with the culture that's been built, you know, within an organization. Yeah. If the organization is not uh, one that is open-minded to candor, uh, then it doesn't create an environment where people can uh, be expressive about how they may feel, you know. So, uh, and, and it's it can be very easy to create uh, the wrong culture in an organization in terms of communication where uh, people don't feel like their voices matter and are valued. And so uh, that's one of the things. And then also, if the organization is not structured in a manner where the culture uh, feels compassionate, uh, it also doesn't open the door for uh, this type of discussion. The dialogue in itself is difficult. Like nobody wants to stand up and say, hey, I don't feel included, or hey, it feels like this environment is not uh, fair or or really uh, giving me equal opportunity. Nobody wants to be the person to shout that out uh, just because it's uncomfortable anyway. And so uh, if we haven't built the right culture, like I said, around candor and compassion, uh, Mm -hmm. then what it does is it leaves people frustrated you know, and, and, and people, you know, they'll have these feelings, they'll harbor them, these conversations will happen amongst employees, and you're trying to figure out why productivity is low, and it's simply because you have people who feel like they're not included in the experience, so they're not giving you all that they can. So how can we change that culture? Well, I think that, you know, it's by making sure that we really do commit uh, to one, the open door policies that a lot of times we say that we have. We say that we're open door, but then people come through our doors and they begin to express how they feel, even not even with, you know, not on this particular topic, but on on many other things. And we immediately reject them or, you know, uh, right. It has to spread across. It has to spread across all topics, all issues. Yes. You know. Yes. Yes. The, the, having the culture of candor should not be specifically earmarked for this particular conversation. It just assists and helping people feel comfortable with having this dialogue. So even as a CEO, I've made sure that my staff knows that they can bring any conversation to me. I'm not going to uh, take it the wrong way. You know, I'm not going to be dismissive of what they're saying. 
Um, but I'm going to make sure that I take time to listen and not just listen, but the candor has to be coupled with the compassion. So they need to know that I'm taking time to understand how they feel about a particular issue, uh, because being quickly dismissive uh, will, will cause them to feel like both of those things are not an option, that they can't be candid with you, uh, but then also that you're not compassionate enough about them. And the subject of workplace diversity requires so much compassion and so much understanding, yeah. uh, even when you may not necessarily be able to relate to what, to what someone else is feeling, uh, it's being able to say that I can have compassion uh, for you and, and, and that compassion will lead to making the steps that are necessary to, to be successful with changing the culture. Right, so we're, we've kind of bled over into the second area, which is creating the environment. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about the candor the inclusion yes. and everything like that. Um, have you had conversations within the own, your own credit union or with other credit unions about trying to create that environment? And then okay. if so, what's the hang up? What's the problem? Is it, is well, it purely personality driven or, hey, that's a taboo topic. We, you mm -hmm. know, everything's fine. Be quiet, you know. Uh, <laughs> So a little bit of both. So yes, I have in the organizations that I've been a part of leading, uh, I've been very intentional about discussions on this mm -hmm. and by actually putting in um, place the strategies to, to do this. So uh, at the board level, I made sure that we were we had a diverse and inclusive board in both organizations I've led. We have that. Uh, the, the executive management team in both organizations I've led, I uh, made sure that we had a diverse and inclusive management team uh, and that that spread out through every layer of the organization. And I think that that uh, credit unions that want to be uh, proactive in this area um, need to begin to right. look at all areas of the organization and make sure that you have taken the time to have this reflected in your management teams, uh, in your board, uh, in mid-level management and frontline. Um, because, you know, I think that a lot of times two things you said. You know, sometimes when this conversation opens up, and I've had it with some people, mm -hmm. uh, that immediately they begin to tell me, "Oh, that's not an issue. Oh, I just cho I just choose the right, the best person for the job, or all of that." And what that ends up communicating is that in, in a scenario where you say, "Well, I just choose the best person for the job," and I'm in that scenario, and the best person never looks like me, it's still communicating that uh, that that I'll never be the best. You know, and so right. uh, I think that making sure uh, that we are intentional about that is important. And the, the roadblocks uh, happen to be in one, it could be just pure ignorance about the topic. And ignorance is not really a bad word. Sometimes ignorance just simply means not knowing. Right. You know, right. I've had conversations with some CEOs on this topic and they say they really think they're doing a good job in this area because they say, you know, you know, well, I've been intentional about making sure my front line looks like this, or I've been intentional about, and, and, and when it comes to workplace diversity and inclusion, right. you know, that's not necessarily uh, enough because what people are looking for is a seat at the table that drives strategy. And so I think that's where the, the ignorant uh, portion of it kicks in because people just don't know. Some people think that they are doing this uh, and maybe they given enough thought and intentionality about what it takes to really make some headway in this area. And so yeah. helping the, the need to create this throughout the organization uh, has been something that I've been trying to lead and something that I've been able to do successfully in the organizations that I have led. So you've hit it uh, uh, on our next kind of issue here is reflecting the membership. Now, yeah. this is something in the friends and colleagues I have in other cooperative sectors, mm -hmm. uh, like the electric co-ops, uh, food co-ops, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, they have the same challenge. They serve yes. uh, rural America or even inner city America. I mean, just pick something that yes. their boards, and it, it's, it is a frustration uh, for not only consultants, but leadership, that their boards are not reflecting the minority uh, uh, population of the people yeah. that they serve, when in fact, in a lot of these cases, the minorities are actually the majority of who are, they are serving. They're just yeah. the minority in our country. So how do we deal with that? How, how do we encourage that kind of uh, change on the, on the faces 
uh, and culture of our credit union boards that are out there? Well, it's it's helping people to understand the the value in uh, different perspectives, you know, because okay. sometimes it can be very easy to um, think that we have all the answers for all the people that we're serving instead of inviting them to the table right. to uh, to provide input, you know. And so, you know, looking at what's happening with uh, the membership is extremely important uh, in determining who should be at the table to make those decisions. It's much easier for somebody who, you know, uh, maybe looks like me, have been in the environments that I've been in, raised in the communities that I've been raised in, to be at the table and make decisions in, with knowledge of how I may feel, what my desires may be, uh, than it is for somebody who has not experienced those things to try to make assumptions. Right. And this goes this goes beyond even just uh, minorities. This has to do with women. Uh, even even a hot topic right now, millennials. You know, I've I've advised um, boards that are trying to uh, reach more millennials to make sure that they bring a millennial to their board because. Mm -hmm. You know, it's difficult to say, I want to reach this particular audience of people, and I'm going to try to see if I can make my best guess and assumption at yeah. what they desire. And so I think when you look at it from that angle, you know, I want to make sure that I'm in tune with what my members want, what the consumers are demanding. Then it, it makes it a little bit easier to understand why there's value in bringing those multiple perspectives uh, to the table. And so help helping organizations to see that uh, is important. And the, the bottom line is, you know, in this day and age, and I know we're going to lead into this, but consumers are looking to find themselves in go. the, you know, they are wanting to to be included. And, um, you know, now, especially the millennial generation is so focused on doing the necessary research to right. determine whether or not they are included in an experience, you know, and so so because of that, I think that it's putting a little bit more pressure on us uh, to be focused on this. And, you know, this is also this is a, to me, this is a human thing. So this is something that we should be doing uh, to, to be uh, successful. So. That, that's a really good point. It's a human thing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's fantastic. So the, the ramifications of all of this is on the consumer side of things. Yes. Uh, and, and you brought up a great point uh, in our earlier discussions about uh, consumers driving inclusion and exclusion explain yeah. that well you know at this point now um consumers have become more knowledgeable mm -hmm. about the value of their dollar and so uh in the past i think that uh maybe that i'm not going to say that knowledge was not there but maybe the level of uh they, the, maybe they're more in, maybe they're more empowered now. yes they are certainly more empowered and so yeah. we've seen examples of this recently uh, let, let's consider the NBA All-Star Game, you know, being moved to the city right. of New York from North Carolina because of uh, exclusion, you know, and, and a certain class of people not feeling included. Let's consider what just recently happened with Uber with 200,000 people deleting the app, and it has caused some impacts on the drivers uh, having lost wages because people felt it excluded rather than included. And so when, when I look at that, you know, you look at those examples and those are very large companies uh, that have had some disruption based upon right. whether or not there was inclusion or exclusion uh, in their strategy. It won't be long before it's happening in the credit union space. You yeah. know, it's probably already happening to some extent, and we don't even realize it that we're having accounts be closed in our organizations because people have done an analysis and determined that they're not included in the experience, so they decide to take their dollars elsewhere. Right. I think that that dynamic is going to grow more and more over the next decade. I believe that uh, millennials will definitely drive a large portion of it, but they're mm -hmm. going to be looking. I know it has. I have become more aware of uh, experiences that I'm included or excluded from. Uh, even as as a consumer myself, you know, and so uh, I think that that's that's something that we need to think about right. uh, because it's something that's very important. So let me kind of wrap uh, start wrapping this up with you a, a little bit. And, and, you know, we're going to explore this topic as we go along uh, this yeah. year. But I want to ask kind of a personal question of you. And, and some might think this is a little bit awkward. But as as a black man down south, mm -hmm. you know, you live just outside of Baton Rouge. Yes. which has had its uh, particular racial tensions yes, over the past yeah. year, mm -hmm. as is Ferguson, you know, and, and events like that. A as a black man down south, characterize this issue from, from, from your heart, 
in, mm-hmm. in your mind and what what is driving this for you to make a change that the industry really needs to see? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll deal with it from some of the, the maybe the frustrations I've felt over the years and then also address where my passion has gone and the work that I've done. But, Great. you know, um, being uh, a black man uh, raised in the South, obviously, uh, I could not avoid uh, the effects of racism. I grew up in a, in a town um, that had a segregated prom uh, and segregated dances up yeah. until 2007, you know. So uh, wow. I grew up in some very interesting environments. And uh, I also learned uh, very early that, you know, a lot of times, especially as a minority, uh, we, are, we, ha- we are taught that success comes with adaptation. So a lot of times we have to adapt to or give up some part of our culture to be successful because of how uh, what has been defined as being professional or, or prepared for the for the corporate world. And so navigating through that as a minority uh, has has had its challenges. It's produced this drive and energy in me uh, mm-hmm. to be successful because I'm that type of person. If there's a limitation place, if there's a ceiling place over me, I'm going to do all that I can to break through it. And so, uh, but I have felt I have been the person in an organization before and not seeing myself represented in executive management when we made up the, the majority of the front lines or even mid-level management. And it was very disheartening uh, because it felt like there was a stopping point, yeah. you know, that, that you can only get so far. Uh, and so, you know, having had the opportunity now to break through some of those barriers, you know, I feel like it's my responsibility to use the voice that I've been given uh, to do more good. And uh, so I'm very passionate about this because my life reflects the work that I'm doing. So I have a very diverse life. You know, if you look through my cell phone, uh, you'll see that on a regular basis, I have an equal distribution of friendships that I'm texting, calling my relationships with colleagues. Uh, I I pastor a church uh, that's also diverse uh, in, in the city of Baton Rouge, which is kind of unheard for, for a black man to have a diverse <laughs> church, you know? And so I live out these things daily because I believe at the end of the day, this is a human issue. And, you know, when I look at, uh, when, we, when we talk about the subject of race, I look at, you know, us being the human race and I truly do believe that. And so uh, I feel like, you know, making sure that we bring some more awareness to this and help people because I've seen people of all races want to do better in this area. Yeah want to have this dialogue, but really don't know how to, and don't know how to get past the the, the awkwardness of it. And so, you know, I, I started saying, man, I, I really wanna do more to help people to get past this awkward talk, this awkward conversation, but even beyond that, to start building the strategies to make sure that we can address this. And, and I'll say this to finish it off, uh, our industry touts, uh, this, this motto or this mantra that we are people helping people, you know, mm-hmm. that literally is what we live by. And so I'd like to propose that that people helping people goes beyond just providing uh, access to, you know, services and, you know, uh, credit and things, things of that nature. But looking beyond that and saying, how can I help people to have opportunity that they did not otherwise have? Mm-hmm. You know, how can I make sure that I'm doing my part uh, to make sure that we do move beyond uh, the things that, you know, the, the crazy things that divide us to create more unity. And, and I think at the end of the day, that makes us a stronger industry when we're all working collectively together and we're creating these opportunities across the board for everybody. Excellent point. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is Ronaldo Hardy. Uh, he is a speaker and consultant in the credit union industry. Uh, again, check him out at RonaldoHardy.com. Uh, Ronaldo, we're going to expand on this conversation as we go forward in the coming sure. months. All right. We're going to bring in more people. We need to talk about this, I think. And uh, I appreciate your time uh, this morning uh, in having this conversation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.